Hey, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Timur. Um, I do music software and I'm also on the C++ committee, although not quite as long as Nico. Um, so most of this is actually not my fault. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, yes. Um, so I'm going to talk about initialization modern C++. It's a shortened version of the talk, so I'm not going to have time to go into all of it because we only have 45 minutes. Um, and here's a, here's a little summary slide. I'm not sure if some of you have seen this before. So um, I think this is a great summary of what we're going to be talking about. Um, so I found this um, GIF somewhere on the internet, and then I retweeted it a few months ago. And then um, some of the comments in that tweet were, yeah, but um, so this doesn't mention these other five types of initialization. So it's not actually complete. So we're not going to have time to talk about all of these. But suffice, uh, sufficient to say that it seems to be a very messy and complicated topic. So there's many, many ways in which you can initialize a variable um, in C++. And actually, um, Nico, um, who is here in the room, there in the corner, um, hiding, um, gave a talk at CppCon uh, last year where he came up with 19 different ways to initialize an int. Um, and um, then there's all these other blog posts, like this one, which tells you how insanely complicated C++ initialization is. And I think like, this is a really remarkable property for a programming language, that something as basic as initializing a variable can be so complicated. And especially here, we are at a conference where there's lots of other programming languages represented, and this kind of area is a fertile source of jokes about C++ developers. It's so complicated just to initialize a variable. So um, giving a talk about this topic is an interesting challenge, uh, but I'm going to try and do it anyway. Um, so what we're going to talk about is different ways to initialize an object as of C++ 17 in the current standard. What these different ways actually do, what pitfalls um, you can fall into, um, recommendations, um, when to use what, and then uh, if we have time at the end, a few slides about what's new in C++ 20, with regards to initialization, and then an overview table over all the different kinds of initialization. All right, so let's start. Uh, obviously, the first type of initialization which you're going to be talking about is called default initialization, which means uh, you actually don't initialize the variable at all, like int i. Now, this is called default initialization. I think it's a bad name because you don't actually initialize it, so why is it called default initialization? I don't know, but that's the way it's called. So default initialization is if you don't initialize it. And in C++, if you have an uninitialized variable and you access the value of that variable, that's undefined behavior, right? So you cannot do that. That's not allowed. Um, and um, that is also true if you have a class. Like here, we have a class widget, and it has some uh, uh, member variables here which are not initialized. And similarly, if you access um, these variables, the values of these variables, like with this getter here, and they're not initialized, then that's also undefined behavior. And it's interesting because um, when I started um, my career as a C++ developer, I think for the first couple of years or so, I did not know this. I thought, well, the classes, but they're fancy. They have constructors. And, and surely this is like initialized to zeros does something meaningful. No, it does not. Right? So I'm sure I, in my first couple of years as a C++ developer, I introduced a few bugs somewhere in some production code because I did not know that this is actually undefined behavior if you don't initialize your members. Of course, later I learned um, that you should initialize them. So the classical way of doing it in C++ 98 is to have a member initializer list like this in your constructor, which is kind of verbose because you have to repeat it for every constructor. Um, it's easy to leave one out. And then um, also it's a bit odd because they're not actually initialized in the order in which you write them there, but in the order they're declared. And it's kind of a bit uh, complicated and error prone. So since C++ 11, we have this better way. Um, we can use default member initializers. We can initialize the members where they are declared. And it's much cleaner because you do it once, you do it for all of them, and then you only override it in the constructor if you have to. But otherwise, um, kind of they're guaranteed to be always initialized to some reasonable default value that you pick. And um, this is something, last time I gave a version of this talk, um, people told me I didn't em emphasize this enough. So 
I made an extra slide, which is the first recommendation, always use direct member initializers. So no matter what you do, my recommendation is you should always do that. And you should not always do that just for you know, floats and ins, but basically for anything. Um, because sometimes, like for example, in this case where you have an atomic, um, actually, if you, uh, the default constructor does not actually initialize the value, you actually have to initialize it to a value like here. So if you have this habit of always writing a direct member initializer, it kind of forces you to think about, oh, but actually I really need to initialize that. How do I do that correctly? How do I, what? So, so it, it just leads to kind of safer, safer and cleaner code if you do that. So that's um, default. Um, so we talked about default initialization. The next one is copy initialization. So default initialization, if you don't initialize it, that's bad. Don't do that. Copy initialization is the next most common thing, which is where you write you know, int i equals to. And so that's one situation where copy initialization occurs where you have the equal sign. Another um, two cases where also copy initialization occurs if you um, take something by value or return something by value. So uh, in all three cases, what you're doing is you copy initialize the variable. So equals value, it's copy initialization. If you pass by value, you copy initialize the argument. And if you return by value, you copy initialize the thing on the other end of the place where this returns. Um, so even though um, there's an equal sign here, actually it's not never an assignment. So equals something we'll co call a copy constructor. Um, so um, it's important to remember that none of the stuff that we talk about here is assignment. I'm not going to talk about any assignment anywhere. So this is construction. Um, and the other thing that's important about copy initialization is that if the types don't match, it's going to perform a conversion sequence. It's going to try to convert the type on the right-hand side to the type of the actual variable on the left-hand side. So if you write int i equals 2.0, then it's going to convert the double to int using the C++ type conversion rules. Um, so um, next type of initialization is aggregate initialization. Now this is something that we also have had in C++ since the old days. It exists in C as well. Um, so if you have an array, which is one type of aggregate, then you can initialize it with this brace syntax, uh, where you initialize the elements of the array and actually that also does array size deduction for you, so you can omit the size of the array and then just put the list of initializers on the right in the braces and it's gonna use the number of um, initializers to reduce the, the size of the array. And it works for aggregates, it also works for um, user-defined types uh, if they only have um, you know, public uh, members and they don't have virtual functions and a few other conditions. So these kind of simple struct-like types that are aggregate types, um, you can use the same syntax to initialize them uh, by member. And C since, so this is the traditional syntax which works since C and C++ 98. Um, and since C++ 11, you can also omit the equal sign. Um, I'm gonna talk more about the syntax later. I personally like the equal sign. I think it's a bit more uh, clear. Uh, it looks a bit nicer, um, but that's just my opinion. Um, so aggregate initialization is actually a bit more tricky than this, so it, it has a few um, other interesting properties. So the first one is um, that you can actually omit some of the things in the initializer list, and then the rest is going to be zero initialized. So what does this program return? Anyone? So this is the program. It has a return statement. What does it return? Oh, sorry. I think I made a mistake there. OK. Uh, widget dot i. No, sorry. Widget dot j. Sorry. I, zero. Yeah, sorry. There's a typo on my slide. I apologize for that. I was changing them last night. So sorry for the typo. Right. So um, let me actually change this right now. Otherwise. It might be confusing. Sorry for that. All right. So this returns zero. So you mention the first element, and then you don't mention the other one, but it's still going to be initialized. It's going to be initialized with zero. 
Um, and actually, that's really useful. So you can use that with arrays too. So if you have like an array with 100 elements and then you just omit all of the initializers, then all of them are going to be initialized to zero. That, so that's a very easy way um, to like zero out a whole buffer of data. Um, another thing that aggregate initialization does is not only does it initialize the things with zero that you didn't write, but it also has this other feature which is called brace elision. So here we have one aggregate type, the widget, which has two integers, and then another uh, aggregate type, the thingy, which has a widget and another integer, like a third integer. So it has like three integers. In, in memory, it's three integers. And now I give it um, two elements. And what does this return? So it looks like this is an aggregate. It has a widget and an int. So it has two members, and I give it two initializers. But what does this program return? Zero. Exactly. Why? Because um, if you have nested aggregates, then brace elision means that if you omit all the nested braces, it still means the same as if you have written them. So it kind of un unpacks all the nested aggregates. So what you're really actually doing is here, you're not initializing W and K, which are the elements of this class, but actually it unpacks the sub-aggregate, and then you initialize just the sub-aggregate. And then you omitted the third one, which means um, it's going to be zero initialized, and this program returns zero. Um, so yeah, um, so those are the things we have so far. We have default initialization. We have copy initialization, we have aggregate initialization, which might do zero initialization. Um, and those basically, we inherited those from C, right? So those behave pretty much the same in C, C++ 98, and, and C++ today. Um, so that's easy so far, I guess. Anyone has any questions about any of those so far? You're all good? OK. So let's, uh, let's continue. So of course, we are in C++ and not in C. So you know, what's the feature that C++ has that C doesn't? Constructors, right? So C++ has constructors. Obviously, you can call them. So the syntax that we have for that is the one with the parens. So you can call, um, um, if you have a class that has a constructor that takes two arguments, this is how you call them. And then um, by analogy, you can also use the same syntax for integers and other built-in types. So anything you can initialize with this um, parent syntax, no matter if it's a user-defined type or not. And that's called direct initialization. So that's the next type of initialization. Direct initialization is whenever the initializer is an argument list in parens, like the round things. So that's also easy to remember. Parens is direct initialization. And then there's a few differences here. Um, with regards to copy initialization, which is the other one we saw before with the equal sign. So for built-in types like integers, floats, bools, they do the same. For classes, obviously the first difference is that direct initialization can take more than one argument, right? So that's the syntax you need to be able to call constructors that take more than one argument. But also there's another difference. Um, if you use direct initialization, it's not going to perform the conversion sequence like equals value but instead it's going to use overload resolution rules um, to call the constructor. So because you have these parents, they look like um, a function call. So it's actually, I think, easy to remember that whenever you have those, then it's going to treat a constructor like a, a regular function call. So it's going to look at the constructors and use the normal overload resolution rules, C++ overload resolution rules of functions, to find the constructor that you want to call and then it's going to call that constructor. Um, so that's how direct initialization works. Um, and actually, um, this difference manifests itself in some situations, like the difference between over resolution and conversion sequence. Let's look at um, some examples. So let's say you have a constructor that's marked explicit, um, which means it's not a converting constructor. So an explicit constructor does not um, is, cannot be part of an implicit conversion sequence, right? That's, that's what explicit means, which means if you call it like this, um, widget uh, w1 equals 1, that's copy initialization. That's going to try to do a conversion sequence, 
In this case, it would be int int, so it's actually a perfect match. You don't have to convert anything. But because the constructor is marked with explicit, it's forbidden. So you cannot call that constructor as part of, of a conversion sequence. So that will be an error. But if you use the direct initialization syntax with the parens, then it's just over that resolution. So you give it an int, it sees an int, perfect match, fine. It's going to call that constructor. Uh, it gets more interesting if you have um, several constructors. Now let's say we have another constructor which is double, which is not a good match for int, right? So it needs to do a kind of a lossy conversion to get from int to double. Um, so, um, but then if you, if you write it with the equal sign, you have copy initialization, then it's going to, so the, it can't call the int one, so it's going to call the double one, because the double is not explicit, so it's going to perform the conversion. But if you use direct initialization, it's going to use overlet resolution, and then it's going to call the int one, because that's, that's a better match. So here, just by using two different initialization syntaxes, we're going to end up calling different constructors. And um, this direct initialization happens whenever you have uh, an argument list and, and parents, right? So it's not just these kinds of constructor calls, but also if you have a kind of constructor call notation when you have like a temporary object, uh, like in the first line, and you have arguments and parents. Uh, the same if you use new expressions and you have the arguments in round parens, or if you have a static cast or like any other kind of cast which also involves parens. This is all direct initialization. Um, and um, this introduces um, a problem because round parens are also used for other syntactic things like declarations. Um, so there is a this particular problem that uh, Nico also mentioned in his talk briefly um, just before this one, uh, which is the most vexing pass. So that's the problem you run into, you can run into if you use direct initialization. Um, basically, here you have a widget and you have a thingy and the constructor of thingy takes a widget and what you're trying to do is uh, you're trying to initialize a thingy by giving it a, a, a default constructed a widget temporary, right? But because you use um, paren paren, what actually happens is that it's a function declaration. And sometimes you run into this thing where you think it's a constructor call, but actually you're declaring a function. That's going to compile, but then if you want to do something with this thingy later, it turns out it's not a thingy, it's a function. And then you get horrible compiler messages later. And you sometimes run into this in, in real life, uh, as Nico had an example with the, if you use these iterators. Like, um, there's something we can do about this. We're going to see some about this um, later. But yeah, keep that in mind that um, there is this vexing pass problem. Um, so what have you got so far? We have default initialization, copy initialization, aggregate initialization, and we have direct initialization, which has this, this problem. You're good so far? All right, let's go to the next um, type of initialization, which is value initialization. What does this program do? Is this undefined behavior? Does this return something? Zero. Turns out, actually, in C++ 98, this was um, UB. This was undefined behavior. But since C++ 03, this returns zero because C++ 03 introduced uh, value initialization. And value initialization is whenever the initializer is a pair of empty parens. So whenever you have paren paren, that's value initialization, right? That's not the thing that we had before. And what does value initialization do? Well, if the type has a user provided default constructor, then it's going to call that default constructor, right? So if you have string paren paren, it's going to call the string strings default constructor. But if you don't have a user provided default constructor, you get zero initialization, which is what we saw just before. So it's not uninitialized, but it's zero initialized, like in the aggregate case where you omit something and then it's zero initialized which is nice because then it is initialized, so it's not undefined behavior. Now, what does this user-provided default constructor mean? This is actually surprisingly tricky. So let's look at an example. Um, so again, we have a struct widget which has an integer inside, and then uh, we have a function that returns a widget, and it, it does widget paren paren, so it, va it, it does value initializes the widget. Um, what does this function return? Zero, exactly. Why? Well, um, because that's value initialization, and widget does not have a user-provided default constructor. Right? It, you, don't, you don't declare any constructors in there. Now, if you add a constructor, 
widget paren paren brace brace, right? So you added, you provided, user provided default constructor, then it changes, right? Value initialization, if you have a user provided default constructor, calls the user provided default constructor. And that doesn't initialize I, so if you just add this constructor, this program becomes undefined behavior. Now, user provided default constructor, we provided a body here, right? We provided a function body. What if instead of writing a function body, you write equals default? Well, then it's fine again, because if you say widget param param equals default, it's um, a user-defined um, constructor, but it's not a user-provided constructor, because you did not provide the implementation. You said equals default. You didn't provide the body. So, you, you, so it's not a user-provided default constructor. It's just a user-defined user constructor. In this case, you still get value initialization. So this returns zero. But one more twist. If you do this equals default out of line, outside of the class definition, then it counts as user provided again. So the only thing I did is I moved the equals default outside of the class. And if you do that out of line, it counts as a function body. It counts as a user provided default constructor. So now this is UB again. So keep this in mind. So user, user provided means either you actually wrote the body of the constructor, or if you defaulted it, you defaulted it outside. There's a reason for that. Um, this you might have done this in another translation unit, right? So when the compiler sees the definition above, it, it has maybe no way of telling whether you equals defaulted it somewhere else. So it doesn't know about it, so it behaves as if you provided a body for it. So it's, it's really, it's a twist that is um, confusing. Um, so that's value initialization, right? So either it calls a default constructor, if you did provide one, or it zero initializes, and then it also has this problem with the most vexing parse, right? So if you write widget, widget, paren, paren, then it's a function declaration. So this is what we have up to C++03. I think we're all, we're all on the same page so far, right? We all understand this, right? So then um, we got C++11, which is now also already eight years ago, actually. So in C++11, the whole picture changed. So what was introduced was uniform initialization, or as I call it, unicorn initialization. And that, that changed the whole picture. Um, so what the motivation was is, let's have one syntax for all these different kinds of initialization. And it's going to be just one syntax, and it's always going to do the right thing, depending on what type you wrote. And also because it uses braces, it doesn't use the vexing pass, it doesn't have the vexing pass problem. So this was an attempt to solve all these problems by saying, okay, let's have one syntax which is, does not create any parsing problems and is always going to do the right thing. I think it's a great idea. Um, unfortunately, it didn't maybe go quite as well um, as intended. So let's look at that. Um, what, what does it actually do, this uniform initialization thing? It introduced this notion of list initialization. So previously, uh, the, the left one was illegal, and the right one would only work in, for aggregates. Now, um, since C++11, you can use both of these syntaxes for anything. So the left one is called direct list initialization, and the right one is called copy list initialization. Um, and um, those things um, in the braces, they're called braced init lists. So it's, it's really, the terminology is a bit confusing because you're gonna talk about initializer lists later, but these like braced things are braced init lists and it's like a grammar, it's a syntactical grammar thing. So those are not really objects. They do not really have a type. They are like this, this weird kind of special entity but they have this one special property which makes things like this work. So if you have something that is not an aggregate type, but is kind of notionally, conceptually similar to an aggregate type, it allows you to use this kind of syntax to do this element-wise um, initialization. Uh, like the best example are all the containers. And, and so if you have this braced init list, it has this, it's not really an object as we saw, but uh, it has this magic property that it implicitly converts to a std initializer list. So if you have a construct that takes a std initializer list, it's going to take this thing 
and it's going to invoke that constructor. So uh, and that makes the syntax possible. Um, so I think that's, that's a good feature. But unfortunately, if you look really at the details of how it works, it's, it's quite problematic. So first of all, std initializer list is, is actually a type, right? It's like a magic library type. It's essentially like a, like a container, almost, like a fixed size container with const elements. That's basically what it is. So it has iterator type, uh, types. So if you want to use it, you need to actually include a header. Um, it, it has like begin end functions. So you actually um, pass around an object if you call this kind of stuff, right? You create and pass around an object. Um, and, you know, this is probably going to be optimized away in an optimized build, but like syntactically, it's, or, or notionally, it's, it's actually an object. Um, so, and this has some unfortunate consequences. Like, for example, because the elements of initializer list are const, it's not working with move only types. Um, I, I, I don't want to go into too many details, but initializer list is quite problematic. So there was, there was this poll on Twitter, like if you had a magic time machine, you could go back in time and remove a feature from C++11, which one would it be? And, and people said that initializer list is the one that we probably should have done differently. There's a whole 90 minute talk by Jason Turner uh, going into the kind of details about how initializer list is broken. Uh, if you want to know, please watch this talk. It's a great talk. Um, and then, um, so what this brace syntax does is it's going to call these initializer list constructors. And this um, sometimes is surprising. So this is, I think, the most uh, well-known example. Uh, you initialize a vector with two integers, and then if you use direct initialization, it's going to use overload resolution to find a constructor. It's going to find a constructor that takes a value and a number, and it's going to construct um, sorry, a, a number and a value, and it's going to construct a, a vector with that many times this value. So you get a, get a vector of three zeros. But if you use braces instead, it's going to call the initializer list constructor, and then it's going to create a, a vector with those elements. So you're going to get a different vector. Now, probably many of you have seen this example, but there's a few examples which are even more, I would say, nasty than this one. So, so this is a good one. Um, so we have a string, and if you direct initialize it with 48 times the letter A, you're going to get 48 times the letter A. You know, easy enough. What happens if you do the same with the braces? Anyone knows the answer? A. Sorry? A, A? A, A? No? Yes. So what it's going to do is, all right, so um, the, the element type is, is, is character here, right? So the first one is not really is an integer, it's not a character, but the second one is a character. So if you do this like really weird conversion where you convert the integer to a character, um, then you can treat this as an initializer list of characters. And what's actually going to do, it's going to take 48, and the ASCII code 48 corresponds to the character 0, and it's going to treat that as a character as well. So you're going to get a string with 0a in it. It's probably not what you wanted. <laughs> so the problem here is that it really tries really, really hard um, to call a constructor that takes an initializer list. And even though there's another constructor here, which is a perfect match, which is the one that takes a number and a, and a character, it's not going to call that because there's this really weird other conversion which allows it to somehow call the initializer list constructor instead. So it's really trying as hard as possible to call, call the initializer list constructor. And it's, I find that kind of hard to reason about. Um, another problem with initializer list is that it doesn't really work in templated code. So one example is this. So let's say you have a, a, a templated function and you, you do this kind of braced init list construction in there. So, so what does this do? So um, you're going to construct a vector of Strings in there? One? No. So that's going to return uh, three. So it's going to construct a vector with three strings in it. So because it sees std vector string, brace three. Now, because three is not convertible to string, so it's going to choose the other constructor which takes a number of elements. But what if instead of string we use int? Then it's going to be one, right? Because 
So the vector int uh, three is, you know, that's an initializer list. Um, what if we use float instead? I don't know, <laughs> actually. It's really hard to reason about this. So initializer brace in it syntax is really, really problematic in templates. Like most of the time in, inside templated code, it just doesn't work. Uh, another problem with this is, for example, you can't um, forward declare these things. Like it's impossible to write, um, you know, an emplace function or a, a make unique or these forwarding things with aggregates because they just don't work with brace init lists. So, um, summary, what does the list initialization do for aggregate types? It does aggregate initialization, as it always did. For built-in types, like integer, float, etc., it's going to do the usual thing as if you didn't have the braces. For class types, it first tries really greedily to call the constructor that takes us to the initializer list, and only if it can absolutely not make that happen, or if there is no constructor with an initializer list, then it's going to do direct initialization, like the normal constructor call. And that's sometimes hard to reason about. And there's one more exception, which is empty braces, and they're special as well. So uh, if you have empty braces here, and you have a constructor that takes an initializer list, it's not going to call that. It's going to call that only if there is no default constructor. If, if there is a default constructor, the empty braces will call the default constructor. So it's actually the, the, the reverse case of the non-empty braces. And so, so this is the rule. Uh, the empty braces will call the default constructor only if there is none, it's going to call the initializer list constructor, and only if that's also not there, it's going to do value initialization, like the same as paren paren. Um, and that also has the same um, caveat as we saw before, value initialization, zero initializes if you have a user-provided default constructor. In this case, um, it would call it, and then if you didn't initialize it, you get undefined behavior again. But if you do the equals default, it's not a user-provided default constructor, so it will do zero initialization. So um, yeah, it's a bit hard, a bit hard to reason about. The other thing about braces is they don't allow narrowing conversions. So that's the that used to be like the most common breaking uh, thing if you move from C++ 98 to C++ 11. Uh, and then there's nested braces. And if you don't have aggregate initialization, there is no brace elision. So it works a bit differently in this case. So this is the good case, where you have um, something like a nested thing. So you have a map, and the element type of a map is a pair. So uh, what you do here is um, you initialize the map with two elements, and then each one of those elements is a brace initialized pair. Um, so that's the good case. That's the evil case. So if you have a vector of string and you have a brace uh, init list here, it's going to construct a vector with two strings, easy. But if you have another pair of braces, what's going to happen then? Right. So that's undefined behavior. Why? Because um, the way to see this is like from the outside to the inside. So whatever is in the outer, outermost braces is going to decide how many elements you have, right? So if you have another pair of braces, then you're going to have one thing. You're going to have one element in there. Um, and then it's going to try to construct this um, one element, this one string in the vector with the inner brace thing. And a string has a constructor that takes a pair of iterators. Now, these are const char star uh, lit literals. So it can then use them to call the char char begin and end constructor of string. And then it's going to treat that as, as like a range. And that's obviously going to go horribly wrong and lead to undefined behavior and make your program crash. So um, you don't get race elision. Um, you don't have an aggregate, and, and, and this is like really re difficult to reason about. So there was this delightful thread on Stack Overflow recently, where depending on how many pairs of braces you have, you get, you get d different results. And um, also, the way they interact with auto is um, not quite straightforward. So since C++ 14 is actually more or less, it's better than it used to be in C++ 11, so what happens now is that 
if you have just the braces, it's going to be do like direct initialization. If you have equals braces, it's always going to construct initializer list. But it's still kind of not obvious, I would say. Um, so there's all these problems um, with list initialization. It's difficult to see which constructor is called because it's not really the usual overload resolution rules. It's, it's very difficult or impossible to use in templates. You have all these extra um, exceptions. And then there's another thing, which is base init lists don't work with macros. So this is not going to compile, because assert is a macro. So if those were parents, there is a special parsing rule that um, you know inside parents, the comma is kind of treated properly. But if you don't have parents, you have braces, they don't have the special rules. So the, the preprocessor will think that this is the end of this preprocessor argument. And then everything just, the parser just completely falls apart. So um, some recommendations, um, which are my personal ones, which might differ from recommendations of other people in the room. Um, so I like using copy initialization for simple things, like if you have you know, int or bool or something else, which is obviously just represents some kind of value. That's a syntax that most programming languages use. It's, it's easy to understand what's going on. So it's, it's kind of easy to read. So I prefer that. Uh, braces I use for the things for which I need to use braces. And I know that a lot of people like, like for example, Nico back there likes to use braces for everything. I think it's, it's really a matter of, it's a decision you have to make. But um, personally, I use braces for the things which I can only do with braces. So that's aggregate initialization. Obviously, you can only do that with braces in C++17. If I want to call a std initializer list constructor, like this vector thing or for other containers, I also use braces. And then I use braces to call constructors in direct member initializers, because you cannot use parens in there. That's not allowed by the grammar. So these are the cases where braces are really, really good. And, and they are doing the special thing that braces do, and I can actually make that explicit by, by writing them. Um, so, and the other thing that braces are really good at is kind of creating and passing returning temporaries. Like if I have a, some kind of simple uh, uh, aggregate type here, you know, I can create temporaries of, of it like that. I can quickly do value initialization like this. And most of the time, uh, very often, if it's obvious what, what uh, type you're passing, you don't actually have to write the types, you just, you just use the braces. And that's like a very elegant, quick way of, of writing this if you're creating a temporary or if you're returning a temporary. So those are the things that you have to use braces for and that you can use braces for and where braces are really good. Um, if you just want to call a constructor, I prefer to use the old, old style syntax. I, I use parens, I use direct initialization. And I know that some people like to call constructors with braces. I, personally, I think it's really hard to reason about. It's hard to understand what's going on. You can't use it to templates. There's all these other problems. So I stick to uh, direct initialization because you know, then I know it's, it's the normal overload resolution rules. I know what they do. I can reason about it. It's, it's easier. Um, there's one problem with direct initialization, which is the most vexing pass. But actually, there is a solution for that as well, because another recommendation is always use auto. This is another thing that I do. And, and this is great, because the biggest danger of this whole thing, as we saw in the very beginning of the talk, is you forget to initialize something, and then you get undefined behavior. Now, if you use auto always, that can never happen, because you cannot write auto x that's not valid. So you cannot forget to initialize it. And this forces you to initialize everything. And this is a really elegant way of, like, if you do this consistently, to avoid all these problems. So I initialize an integer like this. If I want to be explicit about what type I'm initializing, then I'm writing the type. I call the constructor, but I do it on the right-hand side, which is the same, really, as the other way around, except that there's no way you can forget to initialize it. And then, actually, if you do this, you don't have the vexing pass problem anymore. It just goes away, right? So if you write thingy, thingy, paren, paren, that's not going to work. That's going to declare a function. But if you write it this way around, there's no problem. Um, and actually, this became really nice in C++17, because before that, this wouldn't compile. So it's, what happens is, um, if you write this style of initialization, 
it's not actually creating a temporary and then copying it. None of that actually happens, right? It's the same as if you write atomic int count equals zero, except that um, the rule before C17 was you still had to have a copy or move constructor available, even though it would never be called because the copy would be elided. But it would still have to be there because, like, syntactically, it's like a copy constructor. So if you didn't have one, like, atomic is not copyable, not movable, it wouldn't compile. Now that's been fixed in C17. So now this compiles, and you can you can always use this for any type, and that's really nice, except in direct member initializers because there it's not allowed. And with long long, thank you. Yeah, but then you would probably use int 64 underscore t anyway instead, so, no? <laughs> um, yeah, so this is what we have now. Um, this is pretty much the complete list of the ways you can initialize a variable in, in C++ uh, today. There's a few other things like statics, which I didn't have to get time to get into, but these are kind of the basic syntaxes. So I think I have a few more minutes, so I can briefly show a few slides about C++20, which is the future, which is the new standard that's going to be released next year. Uh, we're going to have two new things in C++20 uh, when it comes to initialization. Are we going to have more? We're going to have some fixes, some slight subtle changes to some of the rules to remove some of the problems. But the two big things are two new ways of initializing things. One is designate initialization, which is this thing where you have dot member, and that uh, has existed in C since C99, and now we're going to get it in C++ as well. Uh, so that is basically another syntax for aggregate initialization. It only works with aggregates, but um, instead of saying, okay, I'm going to um, initialize the first n members, you can initialize any members and leave out any members in between, and they're going to be zero initialized. So it's a bit more flexible, and it's, it's um, essentially a C compatibility feature, because the C people had that since 99. So the C++ version um, works slightly differently. Um, well, it does the same thing, but a few things that are allowed in C are not allowed in C++, like doing it out of order, because in C++ the initialization order actually matters, because things are destructed in a reverse order of construction and things like that. And there's a few things that you cannot do, but um, when you can use it, it's going to do the thing that it does in C. And the other big thing that we're going to get in C++20 is this, which is um, direct initialization of aggregates. So we saw that brace init lists have a number of problems, including they don't work in macros and they don't work in templated code. And that's actually a big problem for people who write generic code and who write libraries, because you can't write something like make unique for an aggregate. You can't write something like in place for an aggregate. It's impossible to perfect forward arguments and then use them in a brace init list. That's just not possible. So um, what you want to do is you want to use parens instead. And in C20, we're going to get that. So you, if you have an aggregate type, no constructors declared here, um, because that's another change in C20. Um, I don't, I'm not going to go into that now. It's a big topic, aggregates. Um, anyway, so. You can use uh, parens to initialize an aggregate, and that works with aggregate um, classes. That also works with arrays, so you will be able to initialize arrays like this. Um, and then I think this is really nice because it basically lets you use aggregate initialization without all the problems of the brace syntax that are just there because of the grammar and because of the special rules. And, and basically what we end up in C20 is this world where Paren, paren, and brace, brace actually do the same thing most of the time, except the parens, they don't call initializer list constructors, and the braces don't allow narrowing conversions. But otherwise, they're pretty much interchangeable. So whenever you need the, to use the parens, for example, because um, you are in templated code, you can use them in all these cases, including for aggregates in C20. If you are not in templated code and not inside a macro and you like the brace syntax, you, of course, can use that as well. Um, yeah, so I think, I think it's, it's a kind of a more unified, um, uh, more flexible world, and maybe also easier um, in C20, because most of the time you can just use parens. Um, yeah, um, that's, that's it, really. Um, just, again, uh, 
my personal recommendations. Always use direct member initializers if you're in a class. Always use auto if you're not in a class. I use the traditional syntax for simple values to initialize them. I use braces for the things where you have to use braces and where braces are really good. I use um, uh, parens, direct initialization to call constructors because I know it's going to do overload resolution. It's not going to do any weird stuff. I can reason about this. Again, this is my personal recommendation. Other people like to use braces uh, for constructors too. Depends on your style guide, I guess. This is my style. It works well for me. So, um, yeah, that's it. And here's um, the last slide, which is a summary table of all the different syntaxes that we discussed and what they do for all the different types of types we discussed. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. You can check out includecpp.org, uh, which is the C++ community that I'm part of. And um, yeah, thank you.